Welcome to the Global News Podcast, your source for the latest and most comprehensive coverage of global events, breaking news, and in-depth analysis. We are here to guide you through the top stories from around the world. Whether it's politics, economics, culture, or science. Hello, this is the Global News Podcast from the BBC World Service, with reports and analysis from across the world. The latest news, seven days a week. BBC World Service podcasts are supported by advertising. The Global Jigsaw is the podcast lifting the language barrier to show you the world through its media. Radio Tehran. Western countries are not the international community. That era has finished. The Global Jigsaw from the BBC World Service. Listen now by searching for the explanation wherever you get your BBC podcasts. This is the Global News Podcast from the BBC World Service. I'm Rachel Wright, and in the early hours of Wednesday the 10th of April, these are our main stories. Arizona's Supreme Court revives a near-total ban on abortion in the state, sparking an angry response from Democrats. From contraception to abortion to IVF, they don't plan to stop until our rights are gone. A large airdrop into Gaza to mark the end of Ramadan. The people of Gaza are very grateful for the efforts that we're going to and we'll keep delivering and keep delivering until we can't give them any more. And the parents of a US teenager who carried out a mass shooting at a school in Michigan are jailed for at least 10 years. Also in this podcast, has the international community turned a blind eye to what's happening in Sudan? This is 100% genocide, I think some of the international communities, they don't react or they just condemn. But there is no intervention. And the lengths a German artist went to to get his art on public display. Arizona has become the latest American state to outlaw nearly all abortions by reviving a law that dates back 160 years to the time of the Civil War. It means that only terminations that save a woman's life will be allowed. It follows a US Supreme Court judgment two years ago which overturned a historic decision that had legalised abortions nationwide, now in effect leaving the decision to individual states. Speaking at a news conference after the ruling, a Democratic member of Arizona's House of Representatives, Stephanie Stahl Hamilton, hit out at Republican lawmakers in the state. Republicans here in Arizona are complicit in this ban and in a nationwide attempt to ban access to the range of reproductive health care from contraception to abortion to IVF. They don't plan to stop until our rights are gone. The topic is likely to be one of the most important issues in this year's presidential election campaign. Our reporter in Washington, Carl Nassman, told me more about the court's decision. Well, this ruling really revives this long dormant law that, like you said, dates back to 1864. That's the time of the American Civil War. Arizona was not even a state yet at that point. And this was, of course, also before women were allowed to vote. This was a 4-2 decision by the Arizona State Supreme Court. Essentially what it says is that now that Roe v. Wade, which was the Supreme Court decision nationwide, which had protected the right to an abortion, now that that has been overturned, there's nothing standing in the way of this old law being enforced. Now, the law, as you said, outlaws abortion except in cases to save the mother's life. It does include prison time as a punishment to anyone who performs an abortion, two to five years in prison. The attorney general in the state is actually a Democrat. So the next question is whether or not this law will actually be enforced. She has vowed not to enforce any abortion bans in the state. That, though, could also be challenged in court. In the meantime, it's expected that abortion services in Arizona will remain in place at least through next month to allow for further legal challenges. Now, of course, Arizona is a crucial swing state in the upcoming presidential elections. And we've heard Kamala Harris already calling for the reinstatement of Roe versus Wade. So it's such a political issue. How will this decision play in the campaign in Arizona? 
Arizona, a battleground state. This is one of the states in the country that could end up deciding the November presidential race. Democrats see abortion access as a winning issue for them. We've seen multiple state races, state ballot referendums in multiple states across the last couple of years. All of them have upheld abortion rights, and at least five different states have voted to secure in their state constitution access to abortion. This is something that Kamala Harris and Joe Biden are already jumping on, and we're likely to see a measure on the ballot in Arizona in November where voters could vote to protect access in their state constitution. If you look at surveys of Arizona, 61 percent of Arizona voters do say that abortion should be legal in most or in all cases. Just 6 percent believe that it should be illegal in all cases. This is not something that's going away. We will see this on the campaign trail heading towards November. Carl Nussman in Washington. Now, it was the largest international airdrop of humanitarian aid to Gaza so far. A coalition of nine nations using 14 aircraft took part in the operation to mark the end of Ramadan. Our diplomatic correspondent James Landau was the only journalist flying with the British Royal Air Force and he sent this report over the skies of Gaza. We're flying at 2,000 feet above Gaza and beneath us is a scene of utter devastation. In the hold are 12 pallets of humanitarian aid, all boxed up and all ready to go to slide out the back. This is one of the RAF's biggest transport aircraft and it's carrying about 10 tonnes of aid. And that's less than the amount one truck can carry across the border on the ground. So this is an expensive and inadequate way of delivering aid. The pallets were packed and loaded at an airbase in Jordan, 14 aircraft from nine nations, including European and Arab countries and the United States. Squadron leader Lucy Pale is in charge of the British side of the operation and said the cumulative impact was beginning to tell. We've been here for three weeks now, continually delivering, and we'll keep delivering until we can't give them any more. There is no organised way of distributing the aid, and people have been crushed trying to make their way to the pallets. International charities say the airdrops are an illusion designed to show something is being done. The aid provided, they say correctly, will not meet the needs on the ground. The air crews here in Jordan accept that, but say it's better than nothing and it is making a difference not least while there is simply not enough aid getting through by road or sea. James Landau reporting from Jordan. Well, as attempts to get desperately needed assistance are ratcheted up, the head of the main UN agency in Gaza, Felipe Lazzarini, warned Palestinians who want to return to the devastated city of Khan Yunus of the threat of unexploded munitions. Our chief international correspondent, Lise Toussaint, asked Mr Lazzarini whether his organisation had the capacity to help Gazans resettle. We do not have enough resources to help hundreds of thousands of people who might go back to Anionis. You have also hundreds of other thousands of people might be forced to be moved if there is an offensive taking place in Rafa. Such an offensive would have disastrous human consequences. But if Israel is making military preparations, don't you have to make aid preparations? The UN will not be part of uh, any forced uh, movement of the population. Is there some rare good news today? Israel says the largest number of humanitarian aid trucks have crossed into the Gaza Strip since the start of this war. What we have seen over the last few weeks is still an average of 150, 180 trucks entering into Gaza, which is uh, far below what is really required. What we need is to flood the Gaza Strip uh, With food, we need uh, more crossing. So if these 400 plus trucks are confirmed, it would be an improvement. But this still needs to be confirmed. I hope uh, that the main reason is that no one wants to take the responsibility of the impact of a man-made famine. It can be reversed. And I really hope that uh, the government of Israel also understands the severity of uh, the hunger situation in the Gaza Strip. If... Nothing is being done now. The impact will be irremediable. As you know, Israel has blocked your convoys from going in to northern Gaza, which is where the fear is that famine 
already exists. Is there any sign that you will be able to bring that aid in? This is a total outrage. We are the main organization in the Gaza Strip, including in the north. I really hope that with the increased number of trucks coming into the Gaza Strip, that this is maybe a sign that the operational environment will improve. It would be a terrible stain in our humanity to see this looming under our watch and to see kids starting to die with a lack of food while we were warning for months that this can be reversed. Felipe Lazzarini speaking to Lise Doucette. For the first time in the US, the parents of a teenager who killed some of his classmates have been jailed for their part in his crime. Jennifer and James Crumbly were convicted of involuntary manslaughter for failing to prevent the shootings. They had bought a gun for their son Ethan, which he used to kill four fellow students at Oxford High School in Michigan in 2021. Speaking in court, Jennifer Crumbly defended their actions, saying they had just acted like normal parents. We were good parents. We weren't perfect, but we loved our son. This could be any parent up here in my shoes. Ethan could be your child, could be your grandchild, your niece, your nephew, your brother, your sister. The parents were also accused of dismissing signs that Ethan's mental health was deteriorating. They'll each spend 10 to 15 years in prison. For more on this, I spoke to our North America correspondent, John Sudworth. Ethan Crumbly, who was 15 years old at the time, was given the semi-automatic handgun as an early Christmas present. He put it in his backpack, took it to school that day, and then carried out the shooting that he had been planning for some time, killing four of his fellow students, injuring six others, and a teacher. He was convicted last year. The sort of premeditated nature of those murders meant that the prosecutors asked for the maximum possible sentence, and they got it. He was tried as an adult and given life in prison without parole. What makes this case so interesting, though, is the fact that prosecutors have also gone after his parents, bringing charges of involuntary manslaughter against them because of what they alleged were their serious failings to take the steps that they say could have easily have been taken to stop this killing taking place. In particular, their failure to secure the weapon was discovered that although the weapon was kept in uh, a kind of gun case, it it had been defaulted to the manufacturer's code. It was just a 000 on the uh, padlock to open that case. And also their failing, the prosecutors alleged, to heed the very clear warnings, they say, that their son was suffering from serious mental health problems. Yes, and we've heard a little bit from Jennifer Crumbly in court today, who said she just did what any other parent would have done. That's a a position she took throughout her trial and some observers have have suggested that her unwillingness to express remorse may in part lie behind the very stiff sentence that she and her husband have been handed today. The defence were arguing that there was a dangerous precedent in all of this, that essentially other parents could now be held accountable for the acts of their children, however predictable or not, and that that was against the greater interests of natural justice. Gun control campaigners will be celebrating it for precisely that reason, that they hope that this sentence will send a message that will resonate in homes right across America where guns are kept within reach of children. John Sudworth. Investigators in Nigeria say they've recovered around $24 million from the former government minister for poverty alleviation. Better Edu was suspended in January. She's denied any wrongdoing. Here's our Africa regional editor, Richard Hamilton. While corruption is common in Nigeria, the suspension of a government minister is extremely rare. In January, Ms Edu was accused of diverting more than $600,000 of public money into a personal bank account. President Bola Tinubu, who's made tackling corruption one of his top priorities, then ordered the Economic and Financial Crimes Commission to carry out a full investigation into her department. They now say they've traced $24 million in 50 separate bank accounts. Commenting on the size of the hall, the chair of the EFCC said this was not child's play, but a big deal. 
Richard Hamilton. Now, The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn is a famous tale of unlikely friendship in 19th century America. The novel follows the journey of a young boy, Huck Finn, who escapes from his abusive father with the help of an African-American slave called Jim. But now a new book is flipping the story on its head, telling it through Jim's eyes instead. Our culture editor, Katie Russell, went to meet the author, Percival Everett. I was playing tennis and I just hit a ball wildly out of the court and I stopped and thought, I wonder if anyone has written Huck Finn from Jim's point of view. (laughs) It turned out no one had. Percival Everett's reworked Mark Twain's classic The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn, the story of a young boy on the run with an escaped slave, Jim, who becomes his friend. He's a character that's quite present on America's literary landscape, but he doesn't get to speak. In the new novel, Jim has a voice. Everett gives the slaves the power of eloquent speech. They dumb down their language only in the presence of white people. Twain's novel is anti-slavery, but liberally uses the N-word and other racial tropes. Unlike some, Everett doesn't see it as a problematic book. Oh, not at all. I think it's a, a wonderful novel in that it's the first time that we have a character who really represents an adolescent America trying to come to terms with what has become the most defining feature of the American experience, which is race. And it was banned back then. They called it trash, suitable only for the slums. And then in modern times, it was banned for different reasons in some schools. Where do you stand on banning? The first thing that fascist regimes do is they ban books and burn them. It's awful. So you would never ban a book? No, we we learn by taking in also the things that are offensive. And you also use the N-word in your book. Do you think James might be banned? One hopes. Why? (laughs) Only because I, I like irritating those people who do not think and read. Of course, I don't want any work banned. Look at what they publish. Look at what they expect us to write. The recent Oscar-winning film American Fiction, about a novelist fighting racial stereotyping in publishing, was based on Percival Everett's book Erasure. He's tackled the subject of race in many of his novels, including his booker shortlisted The Trees, about lynchings past and present. There's a part of me that is angry. There's also an acceptance of the nature of human beings. How do you perceive the legacy of slavery in America? There's a faction in the States that would have us ignore the fact that slavery ever existed. And that's a way of ignoring how slavery has impacted the lives of people to this day. My great-grandmother at one point was a slave. That's how close it is to us in time. And yet has never fully been addressed. Everett's fortunate not to need financial aid himself but of course is still looking for success from his new novel. If I sell, let's be really optimistic, uh, 70,000 books, everyone will be thrilled to death. It's a much smaller audience, but I don't think any of us would make any of these things if we didn't, in some part of us, think that we could affect the world, however small that effect might be. And I take to heart the reception of Guernica, Picasso's painting about Franco's Spain, It did affect the world. It did change things. And what I always remember is very few people actually saw it. That report by Katie Razzle. Still to come on the Global News Podcast, Indigenous and Pacific Island leaders give whales legal personhood. The goal here is to not only be legal persons with inherent rights, part of that includes the freedom of movement, to a healthy environment, healthy oceans, the restoration of their populations. Jacob Zuma has been a prominent figure in South African politics since the dark days of apartheid. More recently, he's been one of the country's most controversial characters. On Tuesday, Mr Zuma wrote the latest page in his own long-running political psychodrama as South Africa's electoral court ruled that the former president could stand in May's general election, overturning a previous ban. For more on the background to the ruling and what it might mean for the election, I spoke to our correspondent in Johannesburg, Jenny Hill. 
Jacob Zuma, a week or so back, was barred from standing in the forthcoming general election in the country. It's at the end of May. Now, he had appealed that decision by electoral officials. They had argued that he couldn't stand because under the Constitution, no one who's been convicted and sentenced to more than 12 months in prison can hold public office. Uh, Mr Zuma was sentenced in 2021 to 15 months in prison, though he only served three months because of uh, health reasons after being convicted of a contempt of court when he refused to cooperate with uh, an investigation into corruption. But the electoral court in South Africa has ruled that he can stand. And that's hugely significant because Mr Zuma is no longer a member of the African National Congress, the governing party that's ruled here for 30 years. And he's gone in instead with a newly formed opposition party and today's ruling means that he'll actually be there, a leading candidate when it comes to the election itself. How much support does he still have? Because when he was president, he had huge grassroots level support from all around the country. Yeah, I mean, this is what's going to be really interesting. People might recall, actually, that at the time of his jailing, there were really nasty, violent riots. So he does have support. And I think despite his conviction and sentencing, there are people who are still you know, very fond of him, particularly in his political heartland of KwaZulu-Natal, KZN, as, as they refer to it here. And that's what political analysts are really looking at. Because, first of all, there's the, the big question, how much is this going to affect his old party? standing in the election. They're already on course for a pretty bruising election with some pollsters reckoning they might actually lose their majority for the first time. Now, with him as their leading candidate, will this new party, MK, do well enough to help the ANC lose its majority? And analysts say if you look at particularly the region of KZN, it could get around 25% of the vote. You might even end up with a situation where this party is acting in, in effect as, as kingmaker. Jenny Hill in Johannesburg. It's almost a year since Sudan was plunged into a civil war which has displaced more than eight and a half million people and left the country on the brink of famine. According to United Nations experts, 15,000 people were killed in just one town in the region of Darfur, where the violence of 20 years ago, which the US called a genocide, appears to be repeating itself. The fighting is between the Sudanese army and the rebel rapid support forces, the RSF. As Mercy Juma reports, targeted killings have been commonplace. Some of what you're about to hear is distressing. Ahmed's hands shake. His eyes fixed on the phone screen. He is watching a video showing five unarmed civilians lined up on a street in Sudan, being threatened by men dressed in the typical style of the rapid support forces and its allied Arab militias. Suddenly, they are shot at point-blank range. Some people told me that they saw a video that I was in, but I didn't take much notice because I don't have a smartphone. The 30-year-old, whose name we have changed, is one of the people in the video who was shot. This was the first time he had seen the footage of what happened. Two of the men, Ahmad's cousin Amir and his friend Abbas, died instantly. Incredibly, Ahmad and the two other men survived. Like thousands of others in Sudan's Darfur region, he says he was attacked by the rapid support forces and its allied Arab militias just because he is a part of Sudan's black African community. After they opened fire and we were lying on the ground, I remember praying and thinking that it was the end. Then someone told us anyone who was just injured should get up and run away. After surviving the attack, he became one of the more than 600,000 people who have fled Sudan to neighboring Chad. Here, almost all of them have seen or experienced violence. Many people told us they were abducted from their homes at gunpoint. We meet 23-year-old Mustafa at a refugee camp in Adri, Chad. He walks with a crutch and says he was rounded up from his home by militia members. He was put in a large group of men. Some of them were shot straight away, but he was first taken to help loot properties and then forced to run to an airport outside of town. They told us to lie down, and then they made us crawl across the runway. My arms and legs were injured. Then I was shot. His account matches other reports. 
The BBC has verified a video of a different group of men being forced at gunpoint to make the same journey to the airport. We show it to him and he says he recognizes five of his friends. He managed to escape but does not know what happened to those he left behind. What is so disturbing for many of the victims and their relatives is the apparent inaction that they feel is coming from the international community. Hatim Abdallah, a senior member of the Black Masalit community, fled Darfur because he was targeted by the RSF who came to his house looking for him. This is 100% genocide. If I have other term to use, I will use. I think some of the international communities, they are silent. They don't react or they just condemn. But there is no intervention. Reports of alleged crimes committed by both the RSF and the Sudanese military continue to grow. There is also no end in sight to the brutal war. Mercy Juma reporting from Chad. The British theoretical physicist Peter Higgs, who lent his name to a new particle, the Higgs boson, has died. He was 94. Peter Higgs changed the world of physics with what was renamed the God Particle and together with his colleague Francois Englert won the Nobel Prize. Our science reporter Rebecca Morrell looks back at Peter Higgs's life. Peter Higgs said there was no eureka moment when he came up with his idea that would change the face of fundamental physics. In 1964, the Edinburgh University scientist proposed a new theory that addressed the question of why the most basic building blocks of the universe have mass. He argued that a new type of particle must exist that would make all other particles heavy. At first, his work failed to make much of an impact. An early scientific paper was rejected by the journal Physics Letters. But by the 1970s, the idea began to take hold. And despite the fact that two other research groups had also worked independently on the same theory, this particle became known as the Higgs boson. The hunt for the Higgs was on. But it wasn't until decades later, when the professor was in his 80s and retired, that it was finally found. We have a discovery. We should state it. We have a discovery. We have observed a new particle consistent with a Higgs boson. In July 2012, scientists at the Large Hadron Collider in Geneva announced that they'd discovered the particle. It took Peter Higgs, described by those who knew him as low-key and modest, by surprise. Well, I would like to add my congratulations to everybody involved in this tremendous achievement. For me, it's really an incredible thing that has happened in my lifetime. It's taken... (laughs) (laughs) The news of the discovery was covered around the world and transformed Peter Higgs from someone known mostly to scientists into a household name. Rebecca Morrell with that report on Peter Higgs, who's died at the age of 94. Indigenous leaders in New Zealand and a group of Pacific Islands have agreed a groundbreaking charter of rights for whales and dolphins. It would recognise them as persons and grant them a range of rights, including the right to cultural expression. The document was championed by the Hinamona Halo Initiative, which is based in New Zealand. Edward Sturton spoke to its leader, Mary Takoko, and to Josh Milburn, who specialises in the philosophy of animal rights at the University of Loughborough here in England. He started by asking Mary Takoko what the new declaration aims to achieve. We believe it marks a very radical shift in the way that we view our ancestors, the whale, which we call Tohora. The goal here is to not only recognise their inherent mana, which is their spiritual essence, but actually to be legal persons with inherent rights. Part of that includes the freedom of movement, to a healthy environment, healthy oceans, and indeed the restoration of their populations. All of nature should have a right to express itself and to ensure that it can survive, just like us as humans. Josh Milburn, what do you make of this? One of the things I find very interesting about this development is the way that it 